All right. Uh, very good morning to all. Welcome to this uh, distinguished lecture of the Information Science and Technology Center, also called ISTEC at CSU. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, much about ISTEC, let me just say a few words. Uh, ISTEC is Colorado State University's Information Science and Technology Center. That's what ISTEC uh, stands for. Uh, we are an organization that covers uh, uh, all colleges on campus, um, and we deal with all issues related to information sciences and technologies. So we're talking research, education, as well as uh, industrial affiliation and outreach. Um, one of the uh, activities that we hold every uh, semester is the Distinguished Lecture Series, of which uh, Today's lecture is one. Uh, we are having a, a, a survey that we, we wish uh, that uh, you can uh, fill out by scanning this QR code. And then there are a bunch of questions that uh, you'll be asked to, to answer in that, in that survey. So, uh, so David, that's how it's done, right? Just QR code. Yeah, just QR code. Um, is it also posted somewhere, David? Okay, so if they don't have a cell phone, I guess. <laughs> All right, good. All right, QR code, you know, it's, uh, it's 2021 or whatever the year is, that 19. Uh, to, to introduce today's uh, distinguished lecture, I uh, would like to uh, introduce you to Professor Francisco Ortega from Computer Science, and he'll introduce the distinguished lecture. So thank you everyone for coming. We have the, the pleasure of uh, having Dr. Doug Bowman from uh, Virginia Tech. He's a professor, uh, he's a Frank Mayer Professor in Computer Science and Director of the Center of Human Computer Interaction at Virginia Tech. Um, uh, so Dr. Bowman is quite influential in the 3, 3D user interfaces virtual reality area. I think that uh, he has multiple papers in I2E and ACM. Uh, uh, he received the Technical Achievement Award from the I2E Visualization and Graphical Technical Committee in 2014. Uh, he received his bachelor from Emory University and his master and PhD from Georgia Tech. Uh, and uh, in my opinion, and uh, Doug may disagree with this, uh, Doug Bowman is probably on the top five researchers on the virtual reality and 3D user interface in, 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 in the field. So uh, and with this, uh, please help me welcome Doug Bowman. Thanks, Francisco, and thanks, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, good. Let's see if I can get rid of this and go to my slides. Great. So uh, thank you very much uh, to ISTEC uh, for inviting me for this and to Francisco for hosting. I really appreciate it. Uh, first time I've been here in Fort Collins. Um, it actually reminds me a lot of Blacksburg, Virginia, where I'm from, uh, being uh, kind of a college town and uh, out in a beautiful rural area. Um, our mountains are not quite as high as yours, but we're working on it. Actually, probably not. I don't know. Um, so as Francisco said, I am a professor of computer science at, at VT, and I've been there for about 20 years. Um, uh, but I'm also the director of the Center for Human-Computer Interaction um, and just a few words about that before I start in on my talk. Uh, so CHCI is an interdisciplinary research center at Virginia Tech that has about 50 faculty affiliates from five different colleges and 20 different departments at the university. Um, and so in that way, it's somewhat similar to ISTEC, I guess. Um, but the, the focus is on uh, kind of human-centered computing, human-centered design, uh, user experience, um, and we take a broad view of that. So not only computer scientists, of course, but also people who do human factors, uh, people who are artists, people who are industrial designers, and so on. Um, and many of the people in CHCI are working on immersive technologies. So 
uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, visualization, um, those sorts of things as kind of the, uh, a coming trend and really important piece of the future of human-centered computing. And so that's what I really want to talk about today. I'm going to talk about uh, some of our uh, work and actually more of my thoughts about augmented reality uh, as a platform for personal computing. It's a little bit of a different talk for me. Um, I'm mostly going to speculate about the future and then I'll talk about a little bit of early research that we're just starting to do. So I don't have a lot of results to show you. Um, it's more thoughts than hopefully they'll get, they'll get the juices flowing and uh, some, some interesting discussion can result. So let me start actually by going all the way back to my grad school days at Georgia Tech. Um, so when I walked into uh, my advisor's office for the first time and said, you know, what can I work on for a project as I start my PhD, he said, okay, well, we have this connection with an architecture firm. And they want to use virtual reality to not only, you know, kind of view their building designs, but to design the buildings themselves inside virtual reality. And I said, okay, sounds pretty easy. Let me go off this weekend and see what I can do. Um, and a couple years later, this is uh, the, as far as we had gotten. So as you can see, we're not designing buildings in the system. We're, we're kind of creating very simple shapes and using some uh, fairly uh, primitive tools to move them around and resize them and, and group them together and so on. Um, we never got to the point where we could certainly design a building in any level of detail in VR in the system. But what it did do is it helped me to understand how difficult a problem interacting in 3D virtual reality is. So you're wearing a headset, so you can't see your own body, right? You're walking around, so you can't use kind of fixed input devices like keyboards and, and mice. Um, the devices that you are using are not super uh, um, high fidelity. Uh, the, the tracking is kind of jittery, right? There's, there's lag and so on. And most importantly, there were no kind of set of interaction techniques or principles that you could use to design these systems. So we kind of had to do everything from first principles, right? And so we got, we, we made some progress, but it's certainly not a usable application. So fast forward uh, another year or two, and at the end of my PhD, I was working on another architecture project in VR, and this time it was kind of landscape architecture. So uh, collaborators at the zoo in Atlanta I wanted to think about how we could use VR to not only visualize, but also to modify the design of the gorilla habitat at the zoo. Um, and so this was a little bit easier problem because we didn't start from scratch, right? It wasn't a blank canvas. There was an existing habitat and we uh, had to figure out how people could modify that design. So we came up with this system that allowed people to change the terrain and move the trees and rocks around and change where visitors were viewing the animals from and so on. And it comes up against a lot of the same problems as the first system did, uh, but it was much more successful, again, because of the fact that, that you didn't start from scratch. And we learned some more about how to do interaction in 3D. Okay, fast forward another few years. Uh, now I'm at Virginia Tech, and I kept working with people in architecture. I don't know why I kept doing that, but they were interested at the time. This collaborator in architecture uh, was a structural designer, structural engineer type. And he wondered, can we use VR to, uh, to put together basic building structures so that then uh, the, the 3D models that the students created could be tested for, like, uh, are they robust in, in the case of an earthquake or something like that? So again, we used a lot of the same techniques. You may be seeing some kind of common themes in these videos, which I'm, I'm glossing over, like pointing with a, with a, a, a virtual laser pointer uh, or using a 2D tablet as a surface to do 2D interaction and then doing 3D interaction out in the world. But again, we, we learned more about how to make it more usable uh, and effective. Um, that's not really the point that I want to make, though, about all these projects. The point is that they were all different kind of attempts to apply VR technology to specific domains. In this case, uh, in these cases, all architecture. But I didn't just work in architecture. I've done applications of VR to lots of different things. So on this slide, we see VR for information visualization, uh, VR for um, engineering of underground spaces like tunnels. VR for training, uh, training people who are operating heavy equipment, training surgeons in trauma rooms, uh, training military personnel, and VR for scientific visualization. So all these and many more are kind of application areas that I have uh, that, that I've looked at over the years, 
as to how we can use VR to make those, uh, those domains better in some way. And the talk is actually about AR, so let me talk just a little bit about one project in AR that we did, Applied, applied AR. This was a, a project using handheld AR, using a, an iPad, where we took students, uh, middle school students, out to a historic site that's in our neck of the woods. It's a historic African-American school that uh, started uh, right after the Civil War and went all the way until desegregation in the 1960s. And the only thing that's left there is kind of one derelict building. And so there's not much to see when you go to this site. We use AR to let people visualize what was the site like at different time periods in history, and then also to access kind of historical artifacts from that site. So we had to think about applying AR to, to history and his, historical inquiry. Okay, so why do I tell you all this? It's not to brag, I promise, because none of those were like world-changing applications. Um, but if I think back on all this work that I've done, all of it really, could be defined or described as being very special purpose or niche, right? So we took one very narrow uh, application domain, a very narrow set of tasks in that domain, and tried to figure out can we use these advanced technologies of AR and VR to, to, um, to work in that area. So very few people would ever use these applications. Um, when they did, it would only be in certain circumstances and for a very specific reason. On the other hand, if I think about computing in general, um, computing in general that we do every day is general purpose, right? It's ubiquitous. Everybody uses it every day for many, many different things. Um, hopefully not too many of you are using personal computing devices right now, but probably some of you are, right? But, but right before or right after the talk, <laughs> you would be using your smartphones, your tablets, your laptops, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's a little bit of a disconnect here, right? Is it possible, I guess I want to ask, is it possible for AR and VR to be used for general purpose ubiquitous computing? So it turns out, of course, that it's, it's not just me who has this problem with applying AR to very special purpose um, uh, application domains. I did a little Google search the other day on what's augmented reality good for, and here are three of the top articles that, that came up. And people said, yes, we should, we should care about augmented reality because it's going to help us with uh, military training or medical training or sightseeing uh, or advertising or gaming and entertainment, um, design and modeling, uh, healthcare perhaps, right? So all of these are also examples of special purpose, maybe you could say niche applications um, that augmented reality would, would be applied to. So that bothers me. Um, why is it? Well, maybe it's partially due to technology. Maybe it's mostly due to the current state of technology. Um, so here's a couple of uh, kind of current state-of-the-art headsets. Uh, there are other people in this room who can tell you more about these. Andy, for example. Um, so uh, on the left is the Microsoft HoloLens 2. And, and I say it's current. It's, it's kind of current. Nobody has one, actually. <laughs> uh, but at least it's been announced, and people have seen them uh, at some points out in the wild. Not many people have them yet. Um, but uh, it's a, a pretty big advance from what I understand. Uh, on the right is the Magic Leap 1, uh, which was a, a huge hype train. I don't know how many of you saw uh, the Magic Leap videos that like promised uh, the world. And it, it does not live up to those promises, but it's pretty good in a lot of ways. So both of these things have excellent tracking. Uh, both of them uh, have very sharp and bright display, uh, pretty good resolution. Um, they've thought carefully about user interface sorts of issues and so on. But they're not things that you would want to wear all day every day. You could not wear these all day every day. I mean, first of all, the battery doesn't last longer than about an hour or maybe two hours. Um, and secondly, they're just uncomfortable, right? And they have small fields of view. Um, and there's not a lot of content to, to, look, uh, to look at on them. So you would not wear these all day. But it's my belief and uh, trust that in the next few years, and I won't really quantify it beyond few, that we're going to have uh, all-day wearable AR glasses um, that are eyeglass form factor, uh, so they're light, uh, they're comfortable, they're maybe personalized to you, they have a wide field of view, uh, they, uh, they, the battery lasts all day, they're bright, bright and usable outdoors, and they have really good tracking. Um, so I think we're going to have this. So the question is, once we have it, what can we do? So here's, here's the interactive 
part of the, of the talk. If I told you that we had a set of AR glasses like that today, and let's say, let's say that they cost $1,000, it's a nice round number, right? Same as like a top, top end iPhone. Um, would you buy those AR glasses if what you could do with them was training, education, navigation, sightseeing, gaming, interior design, and advertising? If those were the categories of apps that you could do on your AR glasses, how many of you would spend $1,000 on those AR glasses? Okay, so people who do research on AR raise their hands, and most everybody else did not, right? So I don't think that would be a very compelling consumer product, right? If, if, if all you could do on your AR glasses were these kind of special purpose and niche apps. And I think this point really uh, kind of hits home if I ask the same question about a smartphone. If all a smartphone could do were those set of applications, how many of you would spend $1,000 on a smartphone? And it wouldn't even be a smartphone, right, because it wouldn't be a phone. Yeah. Maybe nobody, right? These are not the sorts of things that, uh, that we're going to spend that much money on because they are not things that we use all that often. I mean, maybe navigation is the most common one there. So maps are really important. Navigation is really important. But if, you're, if all your smartphone did was navigation and then you could play games, I don't think you would spend $1,000. So when will augmented reality be widely desirable? Um, well, let me try to make an analogy here. So let's think about why smartphones became like the thing that every single person, how many people have a smartphone in their pocket right now? Yeah, almost every hand is raised, maybe every hand is raised. Um, I don't think they became popular because of navigation, because of games, uh, because of weather apps, right? I don't think many of you would disagree with me on that. I think they became popular because compared to what I would do on my PC, um, Right? And I'm not talking about content creation here, like using Microsoft Word, but browsing the web, doing my email, getting my calendar, looking at my reminders, all of those things. Smartphones could do those things, plus they could do them on the go, right? I don't have to be with my computer, plus they gave you a phone and messaging apps, plus, and a camera, and plus they gave you all these kind of bonus apps. So all the things that I listed on the previous slide I would say are kind of bonus apps, except for maybe navigation, right? So I think that AR will probably follow a similar route. Um, that is when these smart glasses can do most of what we do on our PCs and our smartphones and our tablets now, and they can do them in a more convenient way, and they add some additional value beyond that, then I think it's gonna be a consumer product that people will flock to buy. Um, so people have thought about, you know, what is it gonna be like when we have uh, these sorts of all day wearable AR glasses? And some people in, in particular have, have painted a pretty grim picture of what it might be like. I don't know how many of you have seen this video, but I, I'm not showing it here, but you should, you should go check it out at some point on your own time, Hyper Reality by Matsuda. Um, he envisions a world where when everybody is wearing AR glasses all the time, that it's basically gonna be used to like paint the world with advertisement, right? Um, and to uh, control you in a way that even you know, Facebook on your smartphone can't control you now um, because it's always gonna be there. It's always gonna be in your face. Your entire life is gonna be lived in this kind of social media type, uh, advertising type world. Um, but there's a, couple, there's a couple of interesting things that are maybe not so dystopian in his vision, um, at least components of it. And so we can see in this screenshot that he envisions that it's not just that we're putting kind of 3D content into the 3D world, but that we also have like apps that are running on our AR glasses, right? And apps can have little windows and windows can float in space. And so we can access content, 2D content, text content, the same way that we do on our smartphones now, but we can access it more conveniently, right? And so this is kind of the, the thing that starts me thinking uh, down this path. So I have a little bit more optimistic vision of future AR, maybe I'm naive. Um, but one thing that's interesting about AR displays, right, is that it's a universal display. It can be a universal display. In other words, we can put any digital content anywhere we want at any time, right? And in particular, that means that every physical display that we have in the real world right now, so this screen on my laptop, these projectors, the screen of your smartphone, etc., all of those could actually go away, right? 
and we could just display virtual displays that were exactly the same or maybe even better than those physical displays. So all displays in the world could be replaced by AR, assuming that everybody is wearing AR glasses. And it's more than that too, right? You could also add value. So it's not just that we're going to replicate what we can do now just virtually, but now I can take my, let's say, my, my three monitor office display setup and I can take it on the airplane or on the train uh, or on the bus, right? I can take it home with me. I can have any number of virtual monitors in any configuration. So if I'm doing a task that requires more space than I currently have, I just make some more space, right? Um, I can access full-size documents, images, and websites while I'm on the go, right? So smartphones do a pretty good job of this, but still, you know, looking at a, uh, at a PDF on your smartphone, it's not nearly as good as looking at it on your desktop computer or your laptop, right? Because the size just never, can never be uh, good enough. You have to zoom in to read the text or you have to zoom out to see the, the whole page. Keep your private information private unless it's explicitly shared. If, if all these displays are actually um, on AR glasses, then um, if you walk up behind me, you don't get to see my virtual monitor unless I tell you that you can see my virtual monitor, right? And receive notifications without having to look at a small separate display. It seems like a very simple thing to reach into your pocket and pull out your phone and look at a notification, but there's actually some, uh, uh, there's some difficulty in that, right? It's, it's an extra step that I have to do. Well, and you say, well, I've got a smart watch. I can look at it on there. But even that, right, requires you to take your attention away from what you're doing in the real world. Uh, this might be a little bit, uh, you doing it in, in AR might be even a little bit easier. So I'm not the first person, obviously, to think about this sort of general purpose use of, of AR, um, just virtual displays. Um, there's a book uh, here by Rolf Heinich called The End of Hardware. First edition was published in 2006, and he says things like, virtual objects and virtual devices will surround us everywhere. They'll soon replace most of today's user interface hardware, screens, keypads, entire installations, and they'll do a lot more. So um, I think this is, this is something that a lot of people are thinking about. Now the question is, can we make it a reality, and do we want to make it a reality, right? So I want to share with you um, just a few things that we're starting to explore in my group uh, along these lines. So the first is just thinking about what does it look like, um, and what sort of features do you need when you have uh, when you have this all-day wearable AR and you just want to do displays with it, right? Simple displays of the sort that we, that we currently have physically. So this is a, a student project in my class from a couple of semesters ago. Uh, they're actually using virtual reality to simulate augmented reality. So the, the world that you see back there is obviously just a simulation of a room. Uh, and you see there there's a physical mouse and keyboard. Well, it's a virtual mouse and keyboard, but it's meant to be a physical mouse and keyboard, right? Um, and you're wearing a headset, and the idea is that you can bring up uh, as many different virtual monitors as you want, and you can use uh, 3D input to place them wherever you want around you. You can bring things next to each other. You can rearrange things. Um, uh, you can, and this can be done for any sort of content that we would currently look at on, on laptops, right? So web pages and uh, coding environments uh, and PDFs and videos and so on. Okay, so that's a very simple kind of first uh, prototype of what this might be like. Um, we also did this in real AR. Uh, so here's a user wearing the HoloLens 1. And the, the interesting thing actually about this video is that um, we're shooting the video through a second HoloLens. And that required quite a bit of technical effort to make it work so that you can see kind of from a, a third person point of view what the, uh, what the user here is doing. But again, we have these 2D information displays and you can arrange them around you in space, in this case using 3D gestures, okay? So that's another vision of our prototype of what it might look like. Okay, but that's certainly not good enough, right? So what I do in my work is think about user experience and about designing for effective user experiences. And I think when we think about this vision of general purpose all day AR, there's a lot of UX challenges uh, that, uh, that immediately kind of crop up. And just a few of them are listed here. I'm gonna go through each one of these um, just really briefly. So I think the first one is, what input devices are we gonna use? And what interaction techniques are we gonna use? So in that very first video that I showed you, I told you, you know, there's a, there's a physical keyboard and mouse there on the table. And I, I would be very loath to get rid of my physical keyboard and mouse or trackpad for a virtual one, right? I, I think that's probably not a good idea. 
um, all sorts of virtual keyboards that people have tried to use have much, much worse performance in terms of text input than physical keyboards, right? So I think if you're sitting at your desk and you're wearing your AR headset and you've got all these virtual monitors or windows in front of you, I think you probably still want to use your physical, traditional uh, uh, mouse trackpad and keyboard. If you're mobile, it gets a little bit more interesting, right? You're not going to carry these devices around with you, um, and you may want to be able to do it while you're walking or, or other sorts of uh, activities where there's no way you could use a physical keyboard or mouse. So the kind of typical answer is, OK, well, we're going to use gesture, right? So I don't have to have any device. I'm just going to wave my hands somehow, and magically the thing that I want to happen is going to happen. Uh, or I'm going to use speech, uh, or I'm going to use eye tracking. Those are all things that I can carry with me quote, all the time, right? They're, they only require my body uh, to do them. So they're the most convenient for sure. Um, but I think they're also limited, right? The, the expressiveness of those, uh, of those input modalities is not as high as the, the physical devices that, that we use in a lot of our general purpose computing, and in particular for text input. And you say, well, of course, speech can do text input. Yes, it can, um, but it's typically slower, and it's when, when you have to fix errors, there are issues, and it's not good when you're in um, situations around lots of other people, right? Um, so there's, lo there's lots of issues, I think, to, to work out there. I think there's maybe a middle ground. I think that maybe people still carry these things around with them in the world that I'm talking about. But instead of using them for their display, or mostly for their display, maybe they're primarily so that we have a convenient uh, physical input surface to use. Um, just a thought. We haven't really done any work along these lines yet, but I have a PhD student who is very much interested in this question, and so I think we'll be doing it very soon. Um, the second challenge is if we have this all-day wearable AR, um, how can the user then transition between doing virtual stuff and doing real-world stuff, right? So I'm working on my virtual monitors, and then Francisco comes up and wants to have a conversation with me. Well, if I have surrounded myself with virtual monitors, I may not see Francisco, or uh, he may not feel that I'm paying atten attention to him. If I, if I put my Word document right next to his head and pretend that I'm paying attention to him, but really I'm composing my, you know, my uh, resignation letter or whatever, um, then that could be a problem. Right? So how do we do this kind of transition back and forth in terms of our attention between virtual and real? And in particular, uh, we're working on this question of occlusion. So if virtual content occludes important stuff, it blocks important stuff in the real world, um, how do we deal with that? So here are a few ideas. Um, so one is that we can adapt something about the content. So if my letter is covering Francisco's face, then maybe when it detects that he's back there, the letter just slides up and out of the way, right? So I don't lose my virtual content, but I can still uh, attend to him. Or maybe it detects that he's back there, and it, and it just gets most, mostly transparent. So it doesn't move, uh, but I can see through the content to him. If we do either of those things, there's a question of, do I need to do this manually, or can the system kind of automatically adapt the content? And then I think there's a question of, what do we prioritize? Do we have the real world view as the default, or do we um, uh, have the virtual content as the most important thing in our system? So here's a little prototype. This is uh, done, uh, again, on a VR headset, but we're using kind of the pass-through mode, using its cameras. So it's a little bit hard to, to understand what's going on here, but this is you know, just a video view of the lab, so you can walk around. And there's these six pieces of virtual content, uh, like apps. And as you walk around, they follow you. So they're attached to your body as you, as you move. Um, and uh, here's an example of making them transparent, mostly, and doing it manually by clicking on them. Um, here's the example of the content is moved up and out of the way most of the time. But when you need to look at it more carefully, you can click on it to bring it down, and so on. So this is just some early prototypes of how these different, uh, these different paradigms might work. So we're running a study right now to try to examine um, the effectiveness of these different, uh, these different schemes, these different methods. And I have to explain a little bit about the study here. So um, you're, again, we're doing the study in VR for control, and because it's easier to program all this stuff in VR. And um, the scenario is you're sitting on a couch watching TV, um, and you're also at the same time babysitting your kid brother. And so that's Kevin over there. He's your kid brother. And Kevin is on the autism spectrum. And so it's very important that when he tries to get your attention, that you pay attention to him immediately. So that's the, 
That's the important real-world information that we need to attend to. At the same time, every now and then you want to get information from one of your apps that's floating around you, and so you need to be able to say, you know, like, you know, what's the temperature going to be at 3 p.m. or some, something like that. So here's one, uh, one of the conditions for that study. Okay, so, oop, I think I went too far. Let me go back. Yep. Okay, so you're watching TV. Kevin is standing there. Oh, so all of a sudden I get a question about the weather. So in this method, I have to manually make the content opaque. I read the weather information and then I answer the question. Um, so the default here is to view the real world. And if I want to view the virtual content, I have to explicitly do it. Okay, so there you saw Kevin waved at me, so I had to wave back. And then I can answer the question from the app. Okay, so that's one condition. Here's another one. Um, this one is automatic movement. So now the system is detecting where Kevin is. And wherever he is, that content moves up and out of the way. So I can see him. I can see the content. He waves at me. I wave back. Now I have to answer a question from that app, so I manually bring it down in order to answer the question. Okay, so we're, we have like uh, eight or nine different conditions of this sort that are different combinations of these ideas. And we're just starting to run this study. So I don't have the results for you yet. Um, it be interesting to know what, what you guys think. Um, another challenge. Uh, so, uh, where should the content be in the world? In other, and what we would say in, in AR is, how should the content be registered? So, most of the time with augmented reality, we, we're thinking about 3D content, we're thinking about having it be in the world and fixed to the world. So, if I have a virtual chair that's just like these physical chairs, it looks like it's sitting on the floor, and as I walk around, you know, I see it from different points of view, and it doesn't appear to move with respect to the world. But when we're thinking about this general purpose AR, there's other things that might make sense. So we might want to register the content to the body. That's what we're doing in the, in the previous examples, right? So I have my, my apps here. And as I walk around, the apps go with me, right? But when I turn my head, they, are, they, they stick to my body, right? So if I need to look at the weather, I can turn my head and look at the weather. Um, or I could register the content to the head, which is kind of like a heads-up display, right? It's always fixed to me. No matter where I look, no matter where I walk, the content is always in front of me. Um, a related question is, how should the virtual content adapt itself to the real world, if it, if it should? So we could be able to do things like, for example, snap the content to walls and other surfaces, or follow the user's walking trajectory uh, with the content. So we explored uh, that in uh, a recent PhD dissertation that came out of my group by Wallace Lages. Um, and so this is that video that you saw before, kind of the manual arrangement of content. But what I didn't show you was the rest of the video, which is that this content can do different adaptive behaviors, depending on what button you press on the little controller that you're holding. So one behavior is that it sticks to your head as you turn around. Um, another behavior is that it goes and finds the nearest wall in the direction that you're looking and attaches itself to the wall so that you can read it like a, a poster or a sign. Um, another behavior is it follows along with you as you're walking, uh, but it's body registered so that you can turn your head to look at different pieces of the content even while you're walking. So Wallace did some studies of uh, this where he had people walk around the lab uh, and also answer questions about the content and also pay attention to some real world stuff. So in one case there was a diagram on the whiteboard that you had to compare to something that you saw in the virtual content and so on. So we found a lot of interesting kind of uh, preferences and design patterns, um, but people mostly liked the kind of content attached to the body uh, pattern. Um, the problem with, with the, the methods that he's using here is that the kind of the default is that the content is right in front of you. So it's always blocking the stuff that you're most wanting to pay attention to in the real world. So you had to do some, uh, uh, you had to, had to use some other techniques to kind of get rid of it. In our current work, we're thinking about the content being mostly out in the periphery, right? And you access the content when you need it. Um, another UX challenge. So how can we allow this information to be accessed um, while we're on the go without distracting the user? That's what I'm talking about, right? So how do we allow you to move through the world, to navigate through the world, get the information when you want it, but not be distracted and not be unsafe? Um, and so. Here, you know, we kind of consider the baseline to be this heads-up display condition, where the content is fixed to my head and it's always visible on the display. I don't think that's probably very good 
for uh, not being distracted or for being safe because you're always blocking part of the, of the real world. Um, but maybe it's useful for some, for some situations. We also have two other ideas. So the first idea is glanceable content. And what that means is that when I look straight ahead, I see nothing. But as I turn my head, the content is just off there in the periphery. Right? And then the third is summonable. And the idea, that's not a word. We just made it up. Um, summonable content means that you do some explicit action to like call the content, to summon the content to your view. And then when you're done with it, it goes back. It goes away again. So let me show you some videos of current interfaces that we're, that we're doing there. Uh, this is using the Magic Leap uh, AR device that I mentioned before. And um, it doesn't do screen recordings very accurately or well. So what you see on the right-hand side is not exactly what the user sees, but it's pretty close. Um, so this first one is the HUD. This is just the content that's fixed to the head. So as you move around the world, you always have these kind of four apps right off on the edge of the display. Here's the summonable interface, and we're using eye tracking for summoning. So we have these four kind of little colored rectangles, which are just gaze targets. And when you stare at one of those targets with your eyes for half a second, the related content kind of slides down into the edge of the display. And when you look away, the content goes away again. And then the third one is this glanceable idea where the content is fixed to the body. So when you turn your whole body, uh, you, you don't see content. But when you keep your body still and turn your head, you do see the content. And that's what we're seeing there on the, the left-hand side. So um, in this study, we're doing another kind of dual task sort of scenario. And we started with walking as kind of the primary task. I think that's going to show up here. Yep. So we have this virtual character uh, who walks around the lab. You see him in AR. Um, and he walks at different speeds. And your job is to follow him and also keep a fixed distance between you and him. So the little colored uh, circle you see on, on his back is giving you a feedback on, on distance. When it's green, you're at the perfect distance. When it's blue, you're a little too far away. When, you're, when it's yellow and red, you're a little too close. And while you're doing that, you're doing a couple of tasks. Uh, one secondary task that we have is to monitor lead changes in a basketball game. So it's like you're just checking ESPN all the time to see you know, how good Virginia Tech is doing against Duke. Um, and then the second task is to look at those four apps that I showed before and answer questions that the system asks you. So we're still uh, processing data from this study, but I can give you some uh, kind of preliminary results, which are surprising. And the preliminary result is that the heads-up display actually performs best uh, on this task, both in terms of, uh, of uh, um, doing the primary task accurately, so following the virtual character, keeping the right distance, and avoiding obstacles. I didn't mention there's some obstacles on the ground that you have to not kick while you're, while you're walking through the space. Um, so uh, on both the tasks, actually, people preferred the HUD. And we think that's because people were focusing on this information access task. And the primary task, the walking task, was, uh, was not very difficult. It wasn't very demanding uh, cognitively or uh, um, in terms of, of motor actions. So uh, we're going to try to up the ante next. And so we're going to now do this in a driving simulator. And we're going to have people driving this uh, simulated car uh, and avoiding traffic and doing lane changes and uh, following a lead car while doing these same sorts of tasks. Not that I'm suggesting that anybody should use AR while they're driving. It's just a, a more difficult task. And we hope to see there that the glanceable or summonable techniques actually will have a, a benefit. All right, so some take home messages. Uh, again, we haven't finished a lot of research on this yet. But it, it, at, at least I think we can say these things. First of all, we shouldn't just think about augmented reality as being for 3D content. It's not just about putting a cute little character that stands on your desk and does cool animations. Right? It can be about, um, about regular knowledge work. It can be about web browsing and email and uh, uh, word processing and all of those things that are not super sexy, uh, but that are uh, they're an important part of, of a lot of our days. Right? But when we do this, uh, we have to really think carefully about the design. Um, so we can't just replicate what we do currently in the real world at our laptops. We have to think about how we take advantage of the unique affordances of AR and address the kind of unique challenges of AR. So there are many open user experience questions. And finally, I would say I think we're just at a, at a sweet spot right now in terms of doing this research because we have some pretty good AR hardware, right? The HoloLens 2, the Magic Leap 1, 
are very uh, robust uh, and, and successful in lots of ways, even though they're not yet all day wearable AR. So we can prototype all of these things that we envision for the future and do these studies, but we don't have them yet. So hopefully the results of those studies can then be applied uh, in a few years when we have, uh, when we have this all day wearable AR. All right, before I, I quit, I want to kind of just circle back now to special purpose applications because I've been talking about kind of using AR for kind of boring 2D content in Windows and so on. Um, and we've got a special purpose application. This is maybe a, a teaser for the other talk that I'm going to give later today on immersive analytics. And so this is um, uh, doing document analysis in, uh, in this case it's in VR, but we also have a, an AR version of this prototype where what we're looking at is a whole bunch of text documents, also images and videos and that sort of thing. Uh, and it's going back to that historical inquiry use case. So a historian works with dozens or maybe hundreds of primary and secondary sources when they're trying to come up with an interpretation of history. And so we thought maybe we can use immersive space in AR or VR to let them uh, uh, spatialize their thought process, right? So all of these documents kind of go together and here's a label that describes them. Or this document has a link to this other document, right? Um, and so we actually did a little pilot study where we put uh, three history students into this space and gave them 100 documents uh, and asked them to answer a guiding question uh, and come up with an outline of a paper that they would write to answer that guiding question. So this is a little bit of, whoops, this is a little bit of that. Can you guys hear that audio? No, you can't hear it. Okay, well, she's talking over what she's doing. But you get the kind of sense of, the, the sorts of things you can do with this 2D content in, in immersive 3D space. So she has read a whole bunch of documents. Uh, she's categorized them. She's labeled them. And what she's also doing is making an outline using labels that she's created of what her paper is going to be. So her thought process has been enhanced by doing this in immersive space. So I'm going to talk a lot more about this at 3 p.m. if you want to hear that talk. Okay. With that, I will stop. I want to acknowledge all my students and faculty collaborators and uh, funding sources that have worked on this stuff. But I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Doug. Uh, so we have some minutes for questions. Um, so I'll give you the mic. Hi. So first off, thank you for the talk. Um, I have a question. Well, I have a several, but I'm going to limit it to one. And um, what do you think about the social implications of AR? Like people walking around wearing always on cameras or being able to browse the internet or watch movies while talking to another person without the other person actually knowing what they're doing on their AR headset? Yeah. Um, it's a it's really interesting question and a super important topic for people to address. Um, I don't have any answers for that yet, but I can give you a personal experience. So. Um, some of you may know the name Thad Starner, uh, who is one of the uh, kind of pioneers of wearable computing. Uh, he's a professor at Georgia Tech, worked on the Google Glass project, etc. But for years, maybe more than 20 years now, he has been wearing a wearable display all day, every day. It's not augmented reality, so it doesn't have tracking, but it is a display that you can always see and that nobody else can see, except for the fact that you're wearing some kind of weird, bulky glass type stuff. Um, and it's a very odd sensation to have a conversation with him. Um, because you see these kind of like quick eye flicks off to the side, and sometimes you also see him doing something down here with a little input device that he carries around in his pocket, right? And so it's like, yeah, is he really paying attention to me? Um, uh, so that's kind of why I think this idea of kind of the system automatically scanning the real world and kind of understanding your current activity, right? There's important stuff that I need to be aware of, or I am having a conversation now, so let's dim or move away all the, the work that we're doing. I think that's, there's an opportunity there for us as designers to kind of influence those social situ situations by designing the system uh, to, to kind of optimize for those situations, if that makes sense. Questions? And the, the second talk will be in com the Computer Science Building, 1.30. First floor, 3 p.m. It's at 3, 3 p.m., right? 3 p.m., yeah. yeah. Okay. Have you done any looks at the Apache helicopters and the heads-up displays there? Because I understand the 
pilots, when they first learn to fly these things, have to have one eye looking in this direction, one eye looking in that direction. They have headaches for weeks until they adjust to it, but they've got amazing visual things they have to do while flying, let alone driving. I just wondered if you looked at that. Um, not in any detail. Um, I know that there's a, a long history of work on heads-up display design for, for pilots and, and other um, situations like that, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of findings that I think would apply to AR. AR gives it a little bit of an extra dimension in the sense that um, because of the tracking, you can have the content appear at different locations in space as opposed to you know, always right in front of you or always attached to your vehicle or what have you. Um, so I, but I think in terms of like attention, that's the most important issue, right? Is can I attend to both the virtual content and the real world at the same time? And in, in two different situations. In, in the Apache situation, the virtual content or the digital content is um, it's tied directly to the real world content, right? So it shows me my, my pitch and my heading and, and maybe where a target is and, and that sort of thing. Um, in a lot of the scenarios that I'm talking about, the digital content is unrelated to the real world that's behind it. Um, and so there's not only a switching like visually, visual attention between the real and the digital, but also like shifting cognitive attention. So those are all, all issues we have to address. Yeah. Looking at that video where one AR headset was used to kind of capture a third person perspective of someone else's mm -hmm. view, um, what sort of work is being done to create shared AR environments? Do you mean like technically how you do it or how you design it? Sure, I've just never seen it before. Is that something that's kind of coming to the forefront now where multiple headsets can be used to create a mm -hmm. single object? Um, yeah, so I think in AR, you know, the, the main thrust of work for decades now has just been getting it to work for a single user, right? Um, they see the stuff, it appears to be in the right place, it doesn't move around. Um, it's a wide enough field of view, it's bright enough, you know, all those kind of technical issues. And so I think just now, now that we have devices like the HoloLens, can we think a little bit more about collaborative and shared usage? There's, there are people who have done a lot more on that than, than I have. But it's just becoming, I think, a research topic. Um, but really interesting. So I, I was actually mentioning to Francisco on the way over here, um, I read an article about this new classroom here at Colorado State for... Um, biomedical education where they have a hundred, it's VR headsets, but a hundred VR headsets in pods of four and the software is designed in such a way that the four students who are wearing uh, headsets in a pod all share the same, uh, the same 3D virtual object. So, you know, a virtual body or body part that's hanging in the air in front of us and we all see it from our own independent points of view. I think that's really powerful, right? Because that's what we're used to doing in the real world. We gather around physical objects and we can really understand what the other people are seeing and what they're referring to very kind of naturally. Um, so we actually are doing a study in my lab right now where we're, we're, we're looking at a, a very simple version of that. So users have a bunch of blocks, on the t uh, virtual blocks on the table in front of them. And one user gets a prompt in their headset you know, to point to block number six or something. And so they point to block number six, and then the other user has to say which block did they point to. And the hard thing about doing that in AR is that the system doesn't know where your hand and arm is necessarily. Some systems might, but by default they kind of don't. And so the virtual content kind of always blocks your hand and arm, even though your hand and arm is above the virtual content. So you get these false occlusion cues, right? So it's not as easy as collaborating around a physical set of blocks currently. So those are challenges I think people have to address. Thank you. Yeah. I, if you're interested, we're beginning to work on share spaces, so you can email. Okay, I will. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I was going to ask the very important question about social etiquette and these things, but I liked someone else already did it. So here's a down in the weeds about the shared augmented reality. I was fascinated by your video with your student with the red shirt on. Mm. Um, why wasn't the student properly semi-transparent when the displays moved behind him? Right. That's, that's related to exactly this question that I'm talking about, right? So the, the current device, HoloLens or Magic Leap, it does map the environment, right? So it's got these depth cameras and so on, and it's kind of building a dynamic model of the environment. 
so that, for example, you can place a virtual character here on this table and it looks like it's on the table. Um, so with the static parts of the environment, it's quite good at doing that, static and nearby parts of the environment. But with dynamic and far away parts of the environment, it's not, not very good, right? So if I were standing here wearing my HoloLens, you know, I could make it so that any content that went behind this wall would be invisible. But I couldn't probably make it so that any content that went behind the door over there was invisible because it wouldn't know that that, that door was there. Um, so that's a challenge, I think, is the kind of real-time dynamic environment mapping, which includes the parts of your body and so on, so that it looks right. It looks occluded correctly in 3D. All right, well, we have time for one more question. Uh, you, uh, you had said that uh, current inter like VR keyboards are jittery, and you know, like when you're interacting with the system, you, uh, the controls aren't as smooth as you expect. Virtual keyboards? Is that what you said? Oh, I'll just speak closer. Then, can you hear me clearly? Now? Yeah. All right. So you've spoken about how uh, keyboards in your virtual reality are uh, like not as smooth, pretty bad performance, and uh, controls are jittery. Mm -hmm. So have you tried interfacing them with? I mean, our phones are already pretty powerful machines. So, have you tried interfacing them with phones or using that to control their virtual? So that's a yeah, that's a good fallback, right? If you if you don't have a physical keyboard, then you know using the keyboard on your phone or tablet can be. Uh, and, and in AR, of course, you can see that, right? In VR, you can't see it, so it wouldn't be it wouldn't be practical to use such a thing. But even those keyboards have a big disadvantage, right? In the sense that they don't have the physical keys that give you haptic feedback when you touch them and press them, although. I think maybe people are evolving <laughs> to be able to use those virtual keyboards almost as well as they can use physical keyboards. I saw a study about that just the other day. So it's, it's, a, good, it's a good option. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for asking questions. Um, uh, Doug, thank you so much for coming. Thank can you, you give a, a, a thank you applause to mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are very grateful to our distinguished lecturer. We have a plaque here to present to him. I'll just read real quickly from it, presented to Doug Bowman in appreciation for your Information Science and Technology Center ISTEC Distinguished Lecture, October 14, 2019. Thank you. Thank you all.